Um, and I want to get started pretty early today, well not early, but on time today, because there's a lot to cover and we may not get all the way through to the end. Um, and if that's the case, we'll finish off whatever we don't get to on uh, Friday rather than rush. Um, because what we're going to talk about today is what our climate has been like in the past. First of all, how on earth do we know what our climate was like in the past? Um, what we can learn from that, so specifically um, how our climate has changed and why our climate changes. So how sensitive is it to things like changes in the amount of solar radiation? How sensitive is it to greenhouse gas concentrations changing? And then we're going to move on into thinking about or sort of looking at the changes that we've observed in the last 100 years and what might uh, lead uh, to changes in the future. Um, so that's really what we're going to do today. First of all, how we know about Earth's past climate. And then we're going to look at a very brief two-minute snapshot of a history of climate change on Earth. Um, and then we're really going to move into looking at some of the stuff that we've been seeing for the last 100 years. Why are we so worried? Um, and that's going to lead into Friday's discussion of what might happen in the future. Because really, if we're looking at the cryosphere and thinking about what is going to change, um, then we need to think about what will happen. So as a reminder, we talked about this on Monday, that weather is the state of the atmosphere at any particular one time and place. So things like, it's amazingly beautifully hot outside today, and I wish I could be by a pool or by the beach. Um, but this is just as exciting, right? Um, and so uh, tomorrow or this weekend, it's probably going to be cooler again. So remember, that sort of weather. What we're talking about when we talk about climate is averages, and long averages as well, 30 years or so of information. So remember that when we're talking about uh, the future discussions. And this is what we ended on on, on Monday. We said that um, the climate system itself is actually very complex. You have to imagine all of the different parts of the Earth system interacting. So things like the biosphere will respond to changes in the atmosphere, and that in turn will lead to other changes. Um, things like our ocean circulation, the fact that where our mountains are, where our continents are over very long time scales will change. Um, the composition of the atmosphere, how much clouds there are, how much ice there is, all of these things affect our climate system. And this is one of the reasons why it's such a complicated system and why it's difficult to get a sense sometimes of what's happening. So first of all, how do we know? So if we want to understand all of this very complicated system, then it makes sense that we might want to learn a little bit more than just, say, the last 100 years or so when we actually have thermometers and rainfall records. We might want to know a little bit longer how much can climate change? Because really, that's a fundamental question. How much of the change we're seeing today is actually due to us? And how much of it might be due to more natural variation climate? So, and also, the follow-on from that is, OK, well, if we are changing climate, how much might it change? And all of those things we can investigate a little bit by looking at what it was like in the past. So the first way we have of investigating that is simply by looking at these sort of very long instrumental records. Um, and certainly in the US and into Europe, it goes even further back. We have pretty good records of, say, temperature. We have patchier records of rainfall amount. Um, and so we can put these things together. We have much less data, obviously, about uh, ocean temperatures over that time. But we can see that certainly in the last 100 years, 150 years, then there tends to have been an increasing trend, which is, of course, what we are all concerned about. But what happened before 1860? In terms of geological time, that's nothing. That's nothing. So what, how do we look further back? Well, we use the geologic record. So the first thing is fossils. If we find fossil alligators up near the North Pole today, then that's an indication that at some point in the past, unless our understanding of biology is radically wrong, then it must have been much warmer. And so, and we can also look at, say, plant fossils. Say, in the Sahara, um, we might find plant fossils or animal fossils there. And those are indications that climate was different. They don't give us exactly how much climate was different by. We can't say it was 10 degrees warmer or 15 degrees warmer. But they give us qualitative measures that the climate was different at a time in the past. As well as fossils, we can also use just landforms. If you've ever driven out through the desert, um, then often you can see things that look pretty flat, 
and they're often old dry lake beds. If you want to go and drive fast around the, and here and set land speed records, then what people do is they go find these old dry lake beds. And those are really good indications that again, it must have been wetter in our region, at least in the past, if these big lake beds uh, existed. And um, not just that, sand dunes give you an indication that it might have been uh, uh, warmer. Um, glacial uh, deposits might give you an example that it's been colder. So my little first question for you today is, uh, hopefully most people have been to Yosemite. If you haven't, it's terribly close, you should go. Um, and this is Yosemite Valley. So what was it that created this valley, this amazing uh, landscape? Is it erosion by rivers, by wind? Was it earthquakes or erosion by ice? A few more seconds. Right, let's see, a li and see how uh, aware people are. So most people say erosion by rivers, but there's also a strong second place, which is erosion by ice. And actually, the people that voted D were right in this case. <laughs> it's yes. OK. So let's think about why that is for a second. And actually, this is going to form the basis for a whole lecture much later in the, in the course. Ice is really very powerful as an eroding agent. And one of the things that you can spot to tell a glacial valley from one that's been carved by rivers is that river valleys tend to be V-shaped. They tend to have this nice V. And the river at the bottom, it sort of fills that V, okay? because that's what's eroding. If we have a glacier, doesn't care about being V, it's a big sort of U-shaped. You have these really sort of wide bases and you might have a tiny little river running through and then these really steep sides. And that's what Yosemite Valley was actually carved by. Those amazing flat, steep cliffs that if you go and see them, then that's actually being carved out by ice. Okay? And so you can imagine that this valley was almost full of ice at some point in the past. So we know that climate has been colder in this region. And if you ever look down from one of those sort of high peaks, if you haven't been, please do go. It's amazing. You can see that there's this tiny river that snakes its way along the bottom. And there's just no way that this enormous valley could have been carved like that. OK? So Yosemite Valley is a good uh, example of a glacial valley. Um, and those, again, it's a very qualitative sense. It's like we, we know there must have been ice, so it must have been colder. But it doesn't tell us exactly how much. And so what I do, this is sort of my research, is uh, looking at proxy records. So just know you, you, you can vote by proxy, right? You can send someone else to vote for you, even if you're not directly doing that. And proxy records are records of natural events that are controlled by or closely mimic and closely mimic climate. So we can't go back 20,000 years and put a thermometer in the ocean. But what we can do is perhaps go and find, say, a coral that was growing 20,000 years ago. And because it formed in seawater, things like the chemistry of that coral, that coral skeleton might respond to temperature. It might have different amounts of magnesium compared to calcium in its structure. And so that will give you a measure of temperature. So there are a number of different proxy records, and some you might be more familiar with than others. So first of all, we have simply cultural records. And I think these are so much fun. For anyone who's a historian in the room or an anthropologist, then we can get a lot of information, actually, about how our climate has been changing from looking at human records. So as an example, this is the price of wheat in four different European countries from maybe 1,200 up to 1,900. Um, and you can see that at certain times, so maybe around 1,600 and around maybe 1,800, all of them showed this increase in the price of wheat. What do you think that might be related to? Drought? That was a really that's a good suggestion. So maybe something to do with things like orbital factors, although this is pretty short time span given we're thinking about like 20,000 years or more. So actually, these are really cold periods in, in uh, sort of the recent time. So if you've ever heard of the Little Ice Age, when we had sort of ice fairs on the Thames in London, which isn't a very good idea now because you would sink, um, we had these sort of peaks. And the reason that we look at, say, all of those countries are because there are other things like social events, wars, unrest, that would also affect, say, the price of wheat. But if we see that pattern in a lot of different countries, then it probably implies something about climate. <coughs> 
But what about natural records? Because this allows us to go back a lot further. And one of the most obvious ones is tree rings. So everybody in the room knows, hopefully, that if you look at, say, a tree stump, then you can count the rings and work out how old it is. Everyone's heard that, right? Yeah. But have you ever thought about looking at the width of the rings? Because if you're a tree and you're a happy tree, you're going to grow a lot. So you're going to have a nice wide ring. If, say, there's a strong drought or if it's particularly cold that year, you might not grow as much. It might be a narrower ring. Yeah, does it make sense? So what we can do is we can, say, look back over the history of the, the life of that tree and we can work out what years might have been better for it to grow and what years might have been worth, worse. Um, and we're not always looking at, say, one particular thing. So some trees are limited by temperature. Some trees might be limited by rainfall. So we have to be quite careful that we know what's happening today that controls that. And it's called a calibration by looking at sort of where the instrumental records match with our proxies. OK? So this is a really nice idea. And has anyone ever been up to see the bristlecone pines, the eastern Sierra? Where do you guys go? Do you just hang out here all the time? OK, so next trip, so next summer or something, you are going to take a trip up to Yosemite and Sequoia, and you're going to go to the Eastern Sierra, and you're going to visit the bristlecone pine trees, because these are so cool. These are the oldest living thing on Earth. You guys have all the best trees. You have the, the biggest and the tallest and also the oldest. Um, and bristlecone pine trees can grow to be sort of thousands and thousands of years old. Okay, and so we can go back a long way by looking at tree rings. And the other thing I wanted to mention, because I always get people who are very upset about this, we don't chop the tree down to, ca to look at the, the widths of those rings. Okay? Um, we actually take a little tiny sort of thin core from the side. So we never cut down our trees if we want to, to look at those. So the second of our natural layered records is to do with ocean or lake sediment. So it doesn't sound terribly glamorous, but it's actually one of the ways we've discovered enormous amounts about the history of climate on Earth. And here's sort of one of the most obvious ways of thinking about it. So here I have a little lake, a little pond, and it's surrounded by vegetation. And as we saw on Monday, then we know that climate is a very strong control on the vegetation that grows. And so, for example, at this time, if our pond is here, then it will start collecting some of those pollen grains from the nearby vegetation. And here's a fun fact that you probably will never need to use again after this, but every single different species of plant on Earth releases a slightly different shaped pollen grain. So if you're very patient, um, then you can actually uh, go through and you can look at these tiny pollen grains and you can actually work out what species they're all from. And that's what we can do by, say, going and taking sort of a core down into that lake. We can look at the older sediment all the way up to the most recent sediment, and we can see the type of pollen that's there. And so we can work out, say, what type of vegetation was around it. But does the, the microphone keep cutting out, or is it OK? It's OK? Good. Um, and so we can do similar things. So in the ocean, we obviously don't have vegetation around that's sort of recorded in the pollen. But we can do other things. For example, if we take cores of ocean sediment, we can get the little planktonic, like floating sort of microscopic creatures that live in the surface waters. And they also form shells from calcium carbonate. And so we can also, again, go back and we can look at the chemical composition and also just what type of plankton is living there and get a sense of things like the ocean temperature through time and right back to sort of 60 million years or more sometimes. So these things are really amazing. Um, and we can also get uh, sort of rainfall amounts, um, nutrient information about the oceans from these. Um, ice cores. We are also going to spend another entire lecture on this later in the class. But just as an introduction um, for that, we have these amazingly thick um, ice sheets on Antarctica and Greenland. And we also have ice in the form of glaciers around in the mountains around the world. And what we can do again is take cores, because those things formed from snow that's compacted down. And as that snow compacts down, have, uh, I know that some of you haven't uh, been in the snow, but if you really want to hurt someone, um, when you build a snowball, what do you do? 
you really press it down, right? Because it basically turns it into ice and then you hurl it at someone you don't like, like your brother or something like that. And so what, that's the same thing that's happening as uh, ice forms. So we get snowfall each year and then it's sort of compacted by what's above it, sort of more and more snow. And so at the bottom, it's ice. But that snow initially is nice and white and fluffy. It has lots of air in it. And as that process happens on Greenland and Antarctica and in glaciers, then some of that air actually gets trapped within that ice. And it's no longer connected to the atmosphere, so it can't escape out or exchange. But there are little bubbles in the ice. Um, and we can go back, because that means that if we can so find ice that's 400,000 years old, we can find little bubbles of air from the atmosphere 400,000 years ago, which is so amazing because we can then analyze the, the composition of that and we can tell you exactly what the composition of the atmosphere was at that time, which is just amazing. Um, and we also get other things from, say, the chemistry of the ice at the same time. We can get temperature records that match with those records of uh, the atmosphere. And this is one of our strongest pieces of evidence that carbon dioxide and, and greenhouse gases are important for our climate. So we'll take a look at some of those records in a second. Um, this is sort of an, a neat one that some people in our department work on, so I like to include it. Uh, cave stalagmites. So everyone's been to a cave, um, and you see these sort of big things hanging down from the ceiling and building up from the floor. And that, those form from sort of drip water, and every now and again when the drip forms, then a little bit of calcium carbonate will precipitate out of that drip water. And again, we can look at the chemistry of those uh, stalagmites in order to build a picture through time of things like how much rainfall there was or where that rainfall is coming from. Um, and so I thought, because rather than just looking at pictures all the time, it's nice to look at real stuff, but this is really heavy. So here's our little stalagmite. And the nice thing is, is that if you turn it around and you look at a slice through it, they're really beautiful. And you can see the layers. And so we can analyze each of those layers, just like we could look at the, the layers in the tree or whatever else. And we can work out the history of uh, rainfall in a region. Um, so these are also really fascinating things. And you're welcome to come take a look at that at the end. And certainly carry it back for me, because it's really heavy. OK. Um, and lastly, we have things like corals. And again, they're layered, they're made of calcium carbonate. We can analyze their chemistry and get at records of temperature, salinity, nutrient content, and even pH of the oceans. So we have, we're not just making this stuff up, okay? We have a whole raft of different things that we can use to reconstruct what the climate was like. And so we have a pretty good picture of what it was like. And that really helps us understand the system. So let's think now, if we know that climate has changed over time, let's think about why it can change. And these really do tie back into what we learned on Friday about those different factors that control our planetary temperature. And you remember the first of those factors were, was the solar luminosity. And so the first of the things that can change our climate are changes in solar luminosity, changes in the output of the sun. And over billions of years, I think I might have said this, the sun has actually been getting brighter, which seems very weird to us, but it's to do with sort of how it's generating energy in the center by fusing elements together, and it's fusing together slightly heavier things through time. And so over billions of years, the amount of incoming radiation has been steadily growing. But we also see other changes. <coughs> do you remember I showed you the sunspot cycle that happens every 11 years? And also, there was sort of larger, longer-term variation on, on top of that. And um, so all of those things are important for climate change. And the important thing to note is that small changes in that solar output seem to provide or seem to produce relatively large changes in climate in a way that we're not entirely sure about yet. It's probably something to do with feedbacks and clouds. That's a really interesting sort of place that we're researching right now. The second thing that we didn't perhaps talk about as much um, is the distribution of our continents and our oceans. So when we talked about Snowball Earth, I said, well, it happened to be that the continents were in a particular location that we could reflect lots of light. And that's the same thing here. If we want to have polar climate areas on Earth, then it helps if we have continents that are near the pole. Also, as we move those continents around, we change the pattern 
of, of winds in our atmosphere, the way that the air circulates, and we also change the way that the oceans circulate. And that can be really important. One of the main reasons that we have so much ice on Antarctica, one of the reasons it's so cold there, is that water can go all the way around it, and it sort of isolates it from the rest of the Earth, and it stops warmer air and warmer waters reaching uh, Antarctica. So those sort of movements of those continents can cause changes in uh, then the proximity to the oceans. So, for example, if we had our big supercontinent, which we had in the past where all of those continents were joined together, then in the very centre, it was obviously really dry because you were so far away from a water source. Uh, the location of continents, whether it's in polar or equatorial, and those, those wind and ocean patterns. And I said we'd come back to this. Um, our orbit is actually really very important, and this is going to come up a couple of times in the class. Uh, so first of all, we have what we call Milankovitch cycles. So these are little changes that happen periodically in Earth's orbit, and they happen because we have other things orbiting the sun. We have our uh, different planets, and these sort of generate slight changes. So the first one, and the one I think is easiest to imagine and picture, it's called the eccentricity cycle. And it's every 100,000 years or so. And all that happens is that our Earth goes slightly more circular, or the orb, not the Earth itself, its orbit become, around the Sun becomes slightly more circular and slightly more elliptical. And then slightly more circular and slightly more elliptical. Okay? So that happens every 100,000 years. So that's our eccentricity. We also have something called obliquity. And this is a cycle that happens every 40,000 years or so. And do you remember I told you about the tilt of the Earth and how today it's about 23.5 degrees from the vertical? Well, actually, on that 40,000 year time scale, it might sort of move up and down a little bit. It might vary from maybe 24.5, so a little bit more tilted, to maybe 21.5, a little bit less tilted than today. Okay? So it's sort of wob sort of moves backwards and forwards like that. So, my first extra mean question of the day. If we increase the tilt, so if we do the top diagram there, if we make our tilt more extreme, what happens to our seasons? So I'm going to give you a minute to think about it and consult your neighbour, and then I'll open up the voting. What do you think happens to our seasons? OK, I think that's more or less everyone. So if you want to vote, if you haven't had a chance to. So let's see if we have consensus. Oh, well done, guys. Yay. OK, A is the correct answer. So let me just go through that for the people that, that weren't certain. Oh, sorry. I'll make sure I get rid of that one. So if our orbit is more tilted, so if you imagine you're stood at the North Pole, <coughs> If you're more tilted over, then you're going to have things like less beam spreading. You're going to have even longer um, amounts of sunlight than you did before, um, less beam depletion, things like that. And so you're going to be warmer in the summer. In the winter, you're going to be even further tilted behind the Earth. And so uh, the, the period of darkness will be sort of longer in terms of, of your season. Um, and so it's going to be much colder. So again, we're not changing the absolute amount of energy that is delivered to Earth from the sun, but we're changing the distribution of it in the different hemispheres and at the different latitudes. OK? Well done, guys. Great. And then the last one was the idea that I introduced on uh, Wednesday, uh, Monday, which I think is actually the most complicated one. So you've had a little bit of an introduction to this already. And uh, our third cycle is called precession. <laughs> And it's to say, maybe every 23,000 years or so. And so I said that today, do you remember in Earth's orbit, we are uh, our winter, our northern hemisphere winter, when our northern hemisphere is tilted away from the sun, is actually when we're closest to the sun. And our northern hemisphere summer, when we're tilted towards the sun in the northern hemisphere, is when we're furthest away. But 11,000 years ago, it was actually the other way around. And so our summers were hotter because now we're tilted towards the, the sun and we're even closer towards it. 
but as an interesting thought exercise for tonight before Friday, think about what happens to the southern hemisphere between today and 11,000 years ago or 11,000 years in the future. What happens to their seasons? It's a good question. And then if there are any Game of Thrones people in the room who likes Game of Thrones, yeah? Then there's a really cool little article there which explains like why you might get so many messed up seasons, like why you get 100 year winters or whatever. So that's really fun and it's to do with Milankovitch cycles, so I thought I'd throw that in there. Okay, so that's our Milankovitch cycles and I think that's one of the most challenging things to grasp. Um, so do have a look over that and uh, come see me if you don't quite get it. The fourth thing that can change isn't really to do with sort of energy being provided to Earth. It's, uh, it's to do with our surface characteristics. And this is coming to the, back to that idea of albedo. So do we have extensive deserts? Do we have extensive forests? What happens to our sea level? Um, and not only do we change our albedo, so how much of that incoming visible shortwave solar radiation is reflected back to space, but things like our surface characteristics can also affect things like moisture um, sort of transport. So if we have our lovely forests sort of sucking up water from the soil, um, a lot of that is lost through transpiration to the atmosphere. If we cut down those forests, then that changes uh, that transfer of, of moisture. Not only that, but we change things like the transfer of gases, we change things like the phosphorus, the nitrogen, the carbon cycle. All of these things are all intrinsically linked together. So surface characteristics are important. Greenhouse gas concentrations, and everyone knows this because it's obviously what we're concerned about. Um, but it's also worth making the point that greenhouse gas concentrations on Earth have changed naturally in the past as well. Um, and that's because on very, very long timescales, on million year timescales, we have volcanic activity that can release carbon dioxide and other gases to the atmosphere. And we also have a weathering. So weathering is that sort of uh, breaking down of rocks. Um, either by wind or by uh, the air. And that weathering process actually takes in carbon dioxide. So one way of getting rid of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere on a very, very, very long, slow timescale is actually weathering of rocks. And that's probably what will happen to all the CO2 we put up into the atmosphere today. It will disappear from the atmosphere, but over hundreds of thousands of years as it gets, sort of weath as, uh, it gets used up in weathering. On shorter timescales, it's all the stuff that you've heard about. Things like deforesting, which returns that CO2 from the, the plants into the atmosphere. Um, ocean temperatures. Um, you know if you leave your soda bottle out in the warm sort of temperatures, then it stops being fizzy. And it's the same thing with the oceans. Uh, our, when our oceans are cold, they can actually absorb and dissolve a lot of that CO2. As our oceans warm up, we can actually get less and less CO2 into our oceans. Um, and then obviously things like burning of fossil fuels, burning of uh, the forests. And these are really important because they often amplify other changes. Um, so one way that we explain the, the pattern of our ice ages is these Milankovitch cycles that explains the timing. But actually in terms of getting the magnitude of the change from being sort of Chicago under three kilometers of ice to today, we need things like changes in the carbon dioxide levels to amplify that initial change in the incoming radiation. Aerosols. Aerosols is not something that we've necessarily talked about yet. Aerosols are tiny little droplets of liquid or particles of solid, and they're so small that they stay floating around in the atmosphere. They don't necessarily settle out. Okay? So there are lots of little aerosol particles in here today, um, and they're so tiny that we don't see them, and they, they just stay in the atmosphere. And aerosols are slightly complicated, because depending on what type of aerosol and whereabouts it is in the atmosphere, they can either cause dimming, so they can increase the amount we reflect back to space and so cool us down a little bit, or they can act just like our greenhouse gases and absorb outgoing radiation and so warm us up a little bit. And so one of our big uncertainties in the future is in sort of looking at aerosols. We, we still need to know a lot more about these. And so examples uh, include things like the ash that comes from forest fires. And so that's my picture here. Here's Southern California with those amazing hot winds like we're experiencing right now um, that generate fires. And uh, you can see the, the smoke drifting off there. 
Things like volcanic ash. Volcanoes are a big source of aerosols. And then there's things that we're doing, things like the, the burning, um, all of that soot that comes out of uh, cars and buses ends up in our atmosphere. Okay? And feedback loops, because I know how much you love feedback loops by now. So I've put up a couple that you've seen before, that atmosphere biosphere feedback loop, the idea that we're increasing CO2 in the atmosphere, which helps plants grow, and those plants take out more CO2. It's our stabilizing feedback, our negative feedback. Our ice albedo feedback, which is that as we increase temperatures, we melt more ice, and so we reflect back less radiation, we absorb more, and so we get even warmer. And that's our positive or amplifying feedback. And then I've stuck in another one, which is things like water vapor and clouds, which is a really important feedback loop. And my next mean question of the day is, can you follow through that diagram and tell me if this feedback loop is positive or negative? So start with an increase in temperature and see if you can follow it around. So I think that's more or less everyone. Let's see if we agree. Let's talk about it for a very brief second. If I increase temperature, what do I do to the amount of water vapor in my atmosphere? I increase it. And that makes sense, right? If I get warmer, then we're going to have more evaporation. So there's going to be more water vapor in our atmosphere. If we have more water vapor in our atmosphere, what happens to the amount of clouds we might have? Increase. So if we're increasing nice, white, fluffy clouds, what do you think happens to the amount of incoming solar radiation? It decreases because more is reflected back. It's basically our albedo, right? So if we're decreasing the amount of solar radiation, what happens to our temperature? Do you want to change your answer? OK, so I'll ask the question again. Got 30 seconds to tell me. Is this a positive or a negative feedback loop? OK, 30 seconds. We'll see if uh, we get a better answer this time. That's a better split. OK, I'll take that. So at least 75% of you are familiar with this idea that if we increase temperature initially, if we follow our loop around, then we lead to a decrease in temperature again. So it's stabilizing us. It's a negative feedback loop. If we followed that loop around and it increased again, that would be an amplifying or a positive feedback loop. In reality, this is actually much more complicated because do you remember that water vapor is actually a greenhouse gas, right? So if we're increasing the amount of greenhouse gases, what do we do to temperature? Increase it. So in reality, this is actually a very complicated feedback loop. And this is another thing that we would like to understand better and be able to model better in our climate system. So here's a quick three-minute version of climate history of Earth. So you can see that here is my uh, age of the Earth. And we're right down at, say, 4.5 billion down here at the bottom. And uh, zero is today at the top. And those little dark bands, those shaded areas, represent times on Earth where we had significant amounts of ice. We had big glaciers and ice sheets. And you can see that it's not the default state of Earth to have ice necessarily. We've had quite long periods of time when there has been no ice on Earth, when we had much warmer air temperatures, we had much warmer <coughs> ocean temperatures, and sea level was way, way higher, like 100 meters higher. And it's really just in the last 20 million years or so that we've developed these really big ice sheets again. OK? So let's look at the last 50 million years now. Don't worry about the geological period names, but uh, down here at the bottom again is 50 million years ago. At the top, it's zero. And now on my uh, x-axis down here, I have temperature of the oceans going from 5 degrees Celsius, very, very cold, up to 20, pretty comfortable. And you can see that our global sort of ocean temperatures have gradually been dropping through time. And the reason that they've gradually been dropping is that we've been redistributing our continents ever so slightly. Uh, we've been changing our ocean currents and our winds. And especially, we isolated Antarctica at that time, at maybe 35 million years ago, when you can see that there's suddenly a, a big drop in temperature and we start growing ice on Antarctica in a big way. Um, and then you can see that if we look right at the top, 
we've really only had sort of big ice sheets in the northern hemisphere for maybe the last two million years. So actually, in geological terms, a lot of our ice is pretty recent. Doesn't mean that it's not important for us today, and it, we wouldn't uh, not uh, we wouldn't want to lose it, but it's uh, re relatively recent. And now let's zoom in at that last two million years when we have had ice in the northern hemisphere. And in yellow here are what I'm going to call interglacials. And these are warm periods between ice ages. Um, and then in the blue here, we have glaciations or glacials. And these are our cold ice age periods on Earth. And you can see that if you looked and uh, counted carefully, up until maybe 800,000 years ago, we had little ice ages every 40,000 years. What do you think might be driving our little ice ages every 40,000 years? What does that sound like? <laughs> Everyone's flicking back. Obliquity. Obliquity. Remember, it's responding to one of these Milankovitch cycles. Since 800,000 years ago, we've actually had these more extreme ice ages every 100,000 years. Which of our cycles does that correspond to? Eccentricity, absolutely. Okay, So you can see that those Milankovitch cycles are actually really important for driving our, our ice ages. But they only explain the timing. They don't explain the magnitude of those changes. In order to explain that, we need to think about these other things like uh, surface characteristics, greenhouse gas concentrations. Um, so if we look at, say, the very, very top of my diagram there, you can see that something is marked called the last interglaciation. It's about 120,000 years ago. And at that time, temperature was more or less the same as, as it was today, or it is today. Our sea level was six meters higher. Half of that probably came from Greenland and half of that from Antarctica. Um, but it was about the same as today. Our last glaciation, our last ice age, the last time we had the biggest extent of ice on our planet was 20,000 years ago. And that was a really different time. So we had kilometers of ice above some of our northern cities, above New York, above Chicago. Um, we had sort of nice big lakes down where we are, but a lot of the, the planet was drier. It was maybe between 4 and 10 degrees Celsius on average, uh, colder worldwide. And that was really unstable. The climate jumped around a lot more than it has been doing today. In the last 10,000 years or so, since that ice melted away, it's actually been much, much nicer. And there's a really nice little video that some of you might have seen at the beginning. And it takes some of what we know about the Earth in the past and pairs it with what we know or what we sort of model for what might happen in the future. And here you can see sort of 16,000 years BC. You can see that we have big extent of ice over Europe, over America. You can see, especially around um, sort of Papua New Guinea, Thailand, we have big areas of uh, extra land because our sea level was maybe 100 meters lower than it is today. And as we move forward through time, sort of to 10,000 years, you can see that ice is gradually melting back, or relatively fast uh, melting back um, in both hemispheres, um, and especially in the northern hemisphere. So keep an eye on what happens, say, from maybe 2,000 years BC onwards. So also, if you're going to go and watch this at home, you can see the CO2 concentration down here. So the average temperature on Earth, and also what the sea level is and how many million people we have. So at this time, we have maybe 35 million people on Earth. Okay? You can see that around this time, we're not really seeing a huge change in the amount of ice we have left. It's pretty much stabilized. But as we hit maybe 1500 AD today, watch what happens to uh, the ice. Whoops. All gone. Um, so this is sort of 2150, 2200. Um, and you can play this forward. And this is what our climate models predict uh, following a certain scenario for, say, population increase and the CO2 increase. So you can see that, yes, we lost a lot of ice after that last ice age. But it's nothing, I mean, the, 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 this is also speeded up. We're only going every 100 years now. It, it's much, much, much faster. The change we're seeing today is really dramatic compared to those big changes that we've seen in the past. So I think that's a really neat little video. So hopefully you can go and watch that and enjoy. Um, and this is, you remember I talked about these amazing ice cores. We can go back maybe 800,000 years and get a record of CO2 and temperature from these. 
And one thing you might notice is that they look like they match really very nicely. In reality, the exact correlation is a little bit uh, more complicated than sometimes is, is uh, explained. But you can see that whenever we tend to have higher CO2 concentrations, we tend to have higher temperatures. And you can see that the CO2 concentration, and it's plotted in parts per million, which is just saying that we have maybe 260 parts per million, 260 um, molecules of CO2 for every million molecules of, of other gases in the atmosphere. Okay. And you can see in the blue where our CO2 is now compared to where it has been for the last 300,000 years and also back as far as 8,000 years. You can see that we have massively changed the, the CO2 concentration in our atmosphere. And in fact, that was what it was in 2007. It hit 400 last year. Okay? So we've really changed it considerably. And remember that the difference at the bottom of this graph, this is sort of a kilometer of ice over Chicago and New York, and that's today at the top. And so it's a big difference. So really, this is our big experiment. If we went as climate scientists to the world and said, we have this really interesting idea, we want to pump a lot of CO2 into the atmosphere and see what happens, no one in their right mind would have let us do this. But we happen to be doing it anyway. And so for us, in very in an imp impartial way, we're really interested to see what happens. But obviously, as a human being and as part of a civilization, then this isn't necessarily good news. So this is our uh, monthly CO2 record from 1960 up to today. Um, and obviously, you can see it keeps going. Um, and this is sort of a, a very famous uh, curve. And it really in inspired a lot of the, the initial uh, concern about CO2. So quickly, because I don't want to bring these back with me on Friday, I want to introduce you to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Because if you are ever writing anything for a report and it has to do something with climate change, this is the first place you should go. These reports are published every six or seven years, and they summarize the most recent understanding, our best understanding of everything to do with climate change. And that's the science part, the bit that we've been doing. It also includes things like adaption and vulnerability, like what aspects of human health, what aspects of agriculture are most vulnerable. And then things like mitigation, what could we do about it? How can we adapt? Um, and these aren't small reports. So I brought 2001. The most exciting thing is, is that the next one is out this year. So you're hopefully going to see lots of this in the media. But our challenge is, this is the science of climate change. OK? So I'm not going to get you to read this. Um, and it is a little bit technical. Um, but it has all the data you'd ever want. It will tell you exactly what the temperature has been doing. It will tell you what rainfall has been doing. It will explain to you how we model things and what those model as tell us. We then have impacts, adaptions, and vulnerabilities. Okay? And this tells you where on Earth we'll be vulnerable, when. And then we have mitigation, what we can do about it. And every single sentence in these reports has to be approved by every single government around the world. And you can imagine what a challenge that is. Okay? And so these things are amazing. And they tend to be, the, therefore, the best source of information. Anything that's a bit dodgy doesn't go in these reports. And if anything, these are somewhat conservative in, in their estimates. Okay? And so what I want to, to say to you is, this isn't necessarily an Earth system science problem anymore. We're definitely some of the people that discovered this and are saying that this is a problem. But in terms of fixing it, we, we can't necessarily fix it for people. This is actually an economic problem, a sociological problem. Um, all of these are like a psychological problem. How do we get people to realize that this is a problem? These are all of the things uh, that feed back into it. Don't pack up just yet. I've still got five minutes. Um, so think about where your interests fit in. Because it isn't just a science problem. This is actually a thing that faces everyone. So let's have a very fast look at how our climate has been changing. So first of all, we have been getting warmer. Our atmosphere has been warming. And since about 1880, we've had a warming of 0.86 degrees Celsius. And that's not trivial. It sounds like nothing at all. But in terms of global temperatures, that's important. 
Um, and it's likely that we've seen increased uh, frequency of heat waves over large parts of the world. I mean, it's likely hotter today than it's been for the last 1,300 years at least. And the thing to remember is that that increase in temperature, that 0.86 degrees, isn't distributed evenly over the whole of the planet. In fact, just as I think I said at the beginning, it's warming more at the high latitudes in our polar regions than it is maybe around the equator or where we are. Okay? So we're definitely seeing more warming over land and at high latitudes. Our oceans, unsurprisingly, have also been warming up. And remember, these oceans are, contain enormous amounts of water and just how much energy it takes to warm up water, say if you're boiling a pan of, of water. So our oceans have warmed at the surface, but we can even detect warming now to maybe below 3,000 meters. Three kilometers in the ocean we can detect ever so slight warming of water. That's amazing. And in terms of the energy that they've been absorbing, they've taken in 90% of that extra energy that the Earth has sort of got from having those greenhouse gases. So these, guys are, these oceans are really saving us from much more extreme changes in our atmosphere and weather. Not only have they been warming up, but associated with that warming, do you remember, is thermal expansion of those waters. And so we've seen an increase in sea level of maybe uh, three millimeters per year, and it's maybe up to sort of 15 centimeters or so, that much in the last 100 years. We're talking about maybe that much by the end of the century. Not only that, but because we've put extra CO2 in the atmosphere, some of that CO2 dissolves in the ocean, and the pH, the acidity of the ocean, is increasing. And that's gonna be a real problem for things that build their skeletons out of calcium carbonate. Unsurprisingly, our cryosphere has decreased, and really this is what we're going to spend the rest of the quarter talking about. The fact that we've been losing ice from our big ice sheets, we've been losing ice from uh, glaciers, sea ice has decreased, permafrost has decreased, we're getting less snow. Um, and I will finish the rest off on Friday. Thanks, guys.